we're finally doing this. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Um, okay, so we're here with, uh, well, we're here with Andrew Salabanks from Cloud Tech uh, Group, and we've got some really great uh, bits of conversation we're going to have. I think it's really cool that we're in your offices here. Yeah. We're talking about like a place where we're going to do it. Like this is probably the best spot. This is the place. Welcome. This is our. Um so NFT gallery. Uh, it's the, the, gallery. Yeah. the gallery. The gallery. It's relatively new. I think you're one of the only people who's used it so far. Yeah, we ran an event for Oz Yeah, but yeah, it's cool. It's a great thing to have as part of your office space. Um, so yeah, I'm glad that we can make more use of it. I think that there's um, there's definitely a, a lot of people that are, are going to um, want to do more events and stuff with you guys. And obviously, like with the NFT frames that you got, it's not just displays, but there's full on. Um, we'll do a little pan around and stuff, I'm sure, later, but there's some really great like uh, things here for the culture that is going to be good. But we're going to um, get into the background of yourself and what you're doing here, and there's a whole lot of the other side, the decentralized finance side of uh, cloud tech. But before we get into that, can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Like, what okay. were you doing before, um, you know, even getting into cloud tech? Let, let's, let's talk about that. Yeah, sure. So, I'm originally from the UK, and... Um, originally, way back when, I wanted to be a pilot. Oh, right. Oh, I didn't but know that. Okay. For reasons that I don't need to bore you with. I, That's I okay. I, I wanted able, to be as well. I wanted to be well, I wasn't yeah. able yeah. to be. I wanted to be, join the RAF. So at yep. the age of 17, I interviewed with the RAF. Wow. Did all the, the tests, but um, yeah, didn't get, because they can take the sort of cream of the crop. Mm. I didn't get it. So I went into economics, uh, an economics degree. Mm -hmm. And then, lo and behold, in the early 2000s, I ended up in London, um, where I was working for Deutsche Bank. Um, oh, okay. So in, yeah, early 2000s, I got a job with Deutsche Bank, um, working in a sort of business management slash COO kind of role yeah. on their trading floors. Nice. Um, which was fun. And look, being at Deutsche between 2001 and 2011 was, it was a fun place. Uh, doing lots of kind of exciting stuff. There were a few bumps in the road. Of course, yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of experience and looking back, it was, it was a fun thing to do. Um, I came here in 2011. My wife's Australian. Um, and so that's why I'm in Melbourne. Um, and did a couple of things sort of off the plane that weren't NAB. I had a quick, I had a stint at Energy Australia. Oh, interesting. Where okay. I worked in um, wholesale, wholesale energy risk, which is actually really interesting because energy is traded in derivatives and swaps and options and all that kind of stuff. So I did that for a while. And then I knew that Drew Bradford was head of markets at NAV and um, knew Drew from Deutsche London. Mm. And so that's kind of how I ended up at NAV, <coughs> where I was doing a similar thing for NAV markets that I'd done in <coughs> in London in that I was, I was part of the... the COO team. Yeah, okay. Um, looking after strategy and innovation and that kind of thing. So yeah, that, I was there until um, November last year. And yeah. look, I, get, I, I don't know whether you want me to get into it now, but sure, the, yeah. the last two years of my time at NAB mm. was spent working on the NAB stablecoin mm -hmm. project. And I think mm -hmm. that's probably the link, or it is the link it to, is, yeah. to, to this, right? Uh, I was... I was head of sort of. I was heading up the strategy and innovation team within Market CRO, um, and I already knew Rob War, mm. um, and he was he was starting to talk about stable coins, and mm -hmm. I forget when it was. It would, it would it, well, I don't know. It's, it's normal. It was a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, just being part of that. It was a small team. Mm -hmm. He was, he was super passionate about it. Yep. The other people in the team were super passionate about it. I found myself coming into a period of my career where I was starting to learn more again. Mm. Like having spent a bunch of time doing this sort of COO slash business management roles for big trading desks, I kind of felt as though I knew that. But now I was, I didn't know. Before, before NAB, I didn't really know what a stable coin was. Yeah. Um, and so being part of that was fantastic. And, and look, I think we, we, we gave it as good a nudge as we could. But in the end, yeah, we've, the all, powers that they we've all ended up here. Yeah, it, it's funny. Like, you know, you try to do innovation from the inside and you can, you can get it so far. And uh, maybe in another dimension, it, it would have meant that you guys had stayed on. But 
given where we're at, like there's opportunities on the outside to, to further the, the learning, as, as you mentioned there. Yeah. Um, city of London, that would have been a lot of fun. I, I used to work in London as well, and the city is a great place, walking distance to most of your clients, unless they're on the West End, if yep. you're selling to the buy side. But um, the, you know, the pilot thing is interesting as well. I tried to, I, I didn't do it as young as you were. So 17, that's probably the smarter thing to do. I did it at 27. Right, okay. So RWAF here did flight screening and all that and then, you know, bombed out um, yeah. through the process, but went through, you know, all the things that you need to do, the psych, the healthy, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but it's a fun experience. Like actually even just, even if you didn't do any flying in part of the process, even if you just did, you know, some flight training that you pay for over a weekend in wherever it was over there, like it, it's fun to get up there. I actually went back and did it. So oh, no way, right. in my, oh, I don't know, late twenties. Yeah. So before I, before we had kids, I, um, I thought, okay, I'm, I've got to do this. It's a, it's a, itch I need to scratch. Yeah. So exactly. I went and, um, paid for myself to go through flight school and got oh, my really? license. Oh, right. So, Congratulations. Yeah, I was flying around. I had a single engine piston license. There you go. So, and you know, could fly around Europe. But it was probably massively yeah. underutilized. It was a fun thing to do, but it's not cheap. So. Um, well, you know, to, to the moon, as they say, or at yeah. least the clouds, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, and so, hey, speaking of clouds, obviously, obviously we're here at CloudTech. That was not pun intended. It works out um, for, for very good reasons. But yeah. just going back to the, the tie into the crypto kind of blockchain side of things and um, that time that you were at NAB, what was that like? Like seeing inside an institution like that, that obviously is big and I'm not gonna say cumbersome in a bad way, but yeah. you know, because the, it is there, these structures are in place for good reason. It manages Absolutely. risk and Absolutely. working in risk is important. On the outside, you know, we've got less structure and we've got the advantage of being quite nimble. What was it like being on the inside, seeing these things happening, I, I guess, on the outside? It was really, really interesting. It was really interesting. Um, we, the board was given an education session on blockchain and decentralized finance wow. and recommended that a number of sort of initiatives be spun off. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those became the Stablecoin project. Mm. Um, and Rob and I found ourselves sitting in front of a whole range of risk committees, mm -hmm. of which there are lots in these organizations. Yeah. Yeah talking to people who genuinely didn't understand mm. what crypto and blockchain was. And so a lot of times our first, one of the first sentences that we'd say to these people was, hey, we're not selling Bitcoin to little old ladies here, right? Mm -hmm. When this, a stable coin is really different. Yep. It's cash backed. It's one for one versus the Aussie. Yeah. Um, Blockchain technology has really great application in mm -hmm. finance. Um, it would be really good in terms of international payments and maybe atomic FX for, oh, yeah. for some of our big corporate institutional clients. Yep. And so most of them got it. In fact, I think to, uh, after, after we yeah. kept going through it with them, a lot of them got it. Um, um, and it sounds like good messaging yeah. from you guys. Um, I can't remember, I, I literally had a pack and one of the slides mm. in the pack was, we are not selling Bitcoin to little old ladies. <laughs> um, yeah. And so you, there, were, there were sort of different degrees of people who were kind of um, pushing for it versus not pushing for it. Yep. I think understandably the, the, the money laundering guys were always like super nervous. Of course. Yeah. Um, but look, we got, we got to the extent we we got to the place where we 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 deployed on we deployed our stable coins on the test net. Mm. We then subsequently dis deployed on the Ethereum mainnet. Nice. Um, another thing that's of interest that's probably worth bringing up here is yeah. that we we went through discussion about should we do private permission to blockchain or should uh -huh. we do public permissionless blockchain. Yep. Um, and within the small team, we kind of felt that the ethos and the philosophy of the space sort of moved us towards doing public permissionless blockchain. Moreover, we, we were, we've put the code, the codes like open source, if you want to find mm. the code. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, that tussle between 
public versus private, there is no, as much as, it's, we've got a lot of maxis in the space. Yep. ETH maxis, Bitcoin maxis and whatnot. And it's good to have that fervor for good reasons, but you can't let it blind you to the situation at hand. And certain contexts, um, if we stuck with that kind of narrative, businesses would not use blockchain at all. Why? Because you can't have, for example, um, certain transactions just being there pseudonymous, that as soon as you and I have done a transaction, you can see all my history on my wallet. Yep. Business would not even touch the stuff. So we have these further innovations that just give people choice. And I think that's really important. And given like the stuff that you guys uh, are now looking to do, and let's get into the cloud tech side of things, um, mm -hmm. apart from the wonderful gallery that we're in right now, um, I think it's important to just have that kind of mindset that, you know, what is being built here by all the people that we interview and yourselves, and we're also yeah. grateful for the sponsorship as well. Um, it's that it's giving people choice to have better things t tomorrow than we have today. And um, on that note, what, what are the things that you guys are doing at Cloudtech? What's your role, first of all, you know, coming so into the space here? I'm head of strategy and operations, which I guess okay. is a good proxy for where I've come from in the roles yeah. that I was discussing Sounds in terms like it, of yeah. business management, COO, strategy. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but really, the day-to-day -day is it's all hands to the pump, right? I mean, yeah. there's, there's, there's a lot of work to do to mm -hmm. achieve what we want to achieve. Yeah, you don't just have like one role, you do multiple. Yeah, exactly. Um, what we're trying to achieve at CloudTech is we're, we're trying to take a holistic approach to the application of blockchain within finance. Mm, because it, okay. it's easy to see that lots of different companies have had a go at the exchange piece or the stablecoin piece. But we've got this four pillar strategy that we're looking at, okay. which is um, we've already got an exchange. We've got mm. Cobweb Pay as the exchange. Yep. Um, we're going to do a stablecoin. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to do an Aussie dollar stable coin, and yep. we can talk more about that in a minute. Absolutely. Um, we have recently signed an agreement with Fireblocks, which yes. we're really happy about. Yep, congratulations. Um, thanks. To be part of their global custodian network, like mm -hmm. qualified custodian network. And then I think the sort of the other one, and it's probably one that will come subsequent to the first three, mm. is asset management. So we've got exchange stable coin, yep. custody, asset management. And so what that gives you is the ability to spend yeah. with the stable coin, yep. store mm -hmm. with the custody, mm -hmm. swap with the exchange, mm -hmm. and then save with the asset management. So the, there's, a, there's a kind of, there's an interrelationship between all four of those, right? Absolutely. And we put the customer at the middle yeah. so that they have stable coins with which they can buy things on the exchange and mm. they can store them in custody and yeah. And so that's that's the strategy in a nutshell. When they, you know, be, being quite complementary to each other, I think is uh, interesting because not that you have to go out and build a whole ecosystem yourself. If anything, blockchain teaches us that uh, you want to utilize the building blocks that are out there. But mm. that shows in the partnerships that you've got. But there is an advantage to going to, you know, you go to ComBank and get your home loan, personal loan, car loan. You can do your banking. You can do a whole heap of these things. Um, there is an advantage to going to a single institution to just have those facilities uh, available to you. And you get um, the benefits of, I guess, the research that you guys do in the space that can help from various areas. And you've got four now, but who knows where it gets to in future. Sure, and, and just maybe on that point, yeah. like, we're not here to be another... Um we're not here to be another point of centralization. Like we don't want to. Yeah. We don't want to be another NAB. Yeah. Um, we're here as as a point of enablement. Yeah. Um, it's a better way to look at it. And yeah. look, I think empowerment and empowerment for customers mm. and the ability to f the facilitation of these things for customers is really what we're about. Mm. Um, because there's benefit in that, right? Mm -hmm. Like the more people we have on chain, mm. the more liquidity we're gonna get, the more assets we'll get, the more RWA we'll get, yeah. the more we can push into the space. I mean, the curve yeah. of adoption, I think everybody's, well, everybody that we talk to is sure. probably um, acknowledge the fact that this is a thing and it's here to stay. Yep. It's just how steep the adoption curve is. Yeah, you know, people probably think that Oh, it's, it's already like matured and stuff, but in one way that might be just a little bit of the, we're still all on the way up and stuff. Because yeah. to your point that the more people are doing stuff on chain, the more people are 
being aware of blockchain, or even if they're not aware of it, it's just being used in their day to day for the benefit of, of whatever it is that they're doing as a business, as an yeah. individual. It's just going to help you know, do more things in this space. There'll be more innovations because it's more accepted, it's more educated. Like It's not like we're starting from scratch. It's the internet thing all over again. Yeah. And it goes back to that ethos of being Web3. But one of the things that you mentioned, you know, going from Web1 to Web2 and Web3, and um, I think we get lost in the prices and all that kind of stuff. And it's great to be invested in the space, whether you're working and it's your time investing or it's money. But um, there, there is a far greater technology play at hand here rather than just the short term gains and stuff is what I'm trying to say. But let's go back to one of those four pillars that you mentioned there and the stable coin. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. And an Aussie dollar stable coin at that because Otherwise, we're exposed, like USDC, USDT, all these things, whatever is you're choosing, and you know, there's the bulls on one side versus the other. They're like this for this reason and like that. Doesn't matter. But if it's not de denominated in Aussie dollar, it means that you as an individual or business are subject to FX risk and there's other, it's just harder to adopt, right? Yep. Um, but tell us more about that. What's it called and uh, what, what are you guys doing? Well, it's gonna be called AUDU. Oh, wow. um, okay, nice. Because it's going to be issued through our ubiquity entity. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We're going to do a range of currencies, as mm -hmm. we were now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but AUDU will be the first one. And just maybe just taking a step back to pick sure. up on a point that you mentioned. Yeah. I, was looking some, I was looking at some numbers the other day. Mm. And to your point, everybody can see, it's plain to see that within the sort of current um, stable coin offering, <clears throat> massively skewed towards US dollars. Mm. So I thought I'd have a look at what the ratio of currencies was in global reserve currency. Interesting, okay. So there's $12 trillion of, approximately $12 trillion of, of global reserve currency out mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Only 55% of that is USD denominated. Really? Yeah. Okay. And so there's, it's like, I forget the exact order, mm. but it's, it's US dollars, sterling yen euros mm -hmm. i think there's probably some cny and i think aussie's then fifth or sixth okay and so of the global fiat currency reserves yeah 55 us dollars three percent is aussie okay. if you then kind of flip that over and go sure. okay right now i'm going to look at stable coins yeah 99.4 of the stable <laughs> coin market yeah is in us dollars yeah funny that <laughs> and so there's a real kind of I don't know what the word is, disconnect between the ratio of currencies yeah. that exists in yep. global reserves mm. and the ratio of currencies that exists in stable coins. Smells like opportunity. And that smells like an opportunity. And yeah. look, since we've, since we've said that we're gonna do an Aussie stable coin, mm. I've had a number, like, a, like a, a noticeable number of people come up to me and say, hey, that would be really helpful for us because in our business, yeah. we currently have to route through USDT or USDC. That's it. And if we had an Aussie stable coin, we could do this, this, and this. I think it opens up a lot of doors. I mean, there was the the CBDC pilot, yep. the electronic Aussie dollar. Um, controversial in some parts of the market. Um, other parts see it as like a you know an inevitability. Um, but whether the Reserve Bank decides to, so in Australia as a, as a nation decides to go down a CBDC route. I bet that it's probably going to be more wholesale, but whatever, even if they do do retail. Um, I think that the point is, is that the tests that were done, the, the initial project, I forget what it was full on called, but it was like a closed selected only groups. Then they went public, 150 um, put in their hat and their idea in the ring. And then they chose 15, 14 of those. Um, and we were one of those uh, wearing my not centralized hat. We tested doing a, we had a, did it with Hedera. We had um, two construction partners and stuff. They're real world companies. And we use the CBDC as a proof of reserve. Stablecoin on top, the idea of this um, stablecoin slash token, uh, it's in a way it wasn't an AUD, but it, because mm -hmm. it's backed by this CBDC for the, the contract worth $20,000 only um, for real world work, it's effectively like an AUD st um, stable coin. It just didn't, you know, we didn't go out there with a, we're not building an AUD stable coin. My, my point is, is that in that case, we did it as like a proof of reserve stable coin on top. 
so that, and others were doing this too, and this is probably some of the others that are saying it, they take away the CBDC pilot, that's done, that was completed, it was just a test to see all the different ideas there. The businesses there that wanted to continue it, but were limited by the fact that there wasn't um, much in the way of uh, Aussie dollar stable coins. There's a few other providers out there, and whether it's the banks, you know, doing their tests and stuff, but we need more mainstreaming of this. Yeah. There is massive need for it, because if you had an Aussie dollar stable coin, this programmability of having either digital escrows or you're using it to make payments for say domestic violence and having these Absolutely. accounts and like all these different things that blockchain can provide because it um, is low cost to be able to do things or it's even better, it's programmable that yeah, we can yeah. do things. It's a massive kind of need. So on that note with the ubiquity stuff that you guys are doing, um, are you, uh, what's the idea there? Like you're gonna provide this, are you gonna try to create and partner with groups that want to you know, do things with AUDU? Or um, are you gonna put it out there and then like just open the doors and see who wants to use it? Like what, what's the idea for getting like um, adoption and traction and stuff? So we're definitely gonna to look to get it on exchange so that Perfect. people can buy it. Um, Good start, yeah. I think our own exchange would be of one course. of those exchanges. I would, I would hope so. Yeah. But we're gonna try and get it on other exchanges yeah, and great. we have conversations that are, that are afoot there. Okay, um, very good. So that'll be one angle. The other mm. angle will be where, given given where I came from and Rob's come from, mm. and, and Drew's also kind of part of this with Katina and, and um, the stuff that is, that's happening there. I think we can probably think of some quite cool use cases for corporates and institutions. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so between those two, those two sort of. Um, pots of ideas. I think they'll they'll keep us busy for a little while. And if people want to, like you know, they've they've got ideas. I guess they'll be reaching out as well, yeah, yeah. right? So anyone watching this? Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. Like I said, I've had a few people come up to me and talk about ideas, mm. um, and how they they say, "Oh, yeah, we'll we need this because mm. currently we're going through US dollars." Mm. Um, yeah, it'll be there. Okay. Well, um, we'll definitely see a, a lot more of that. So. Coming uh, back to it, you've come from TradFi, you've come into the blockchain space. You've been here how long now? What's... Three months, just. Wait, it's only three months? Yep. Oh, I thought, if, why does it feel like longer? Like I thought maybe <laughs> you got in, we, maybe we'd had conversations late last year. It was three months. I started, I started like the second week in April. Okay. Time flies and um, it feels like a lot longer because I guess you guys have done so much and yeah. we've had so many conversations. So, what? It, yeah, there must be a rule. Like, it's like dog years. Like, one day in, um, you know, crypto is like seven years. No, <laughs> not that bad. But um, just wondering from, from your perspective, seeing both sides of the, the aisle there, how does traditional, like, organizations and finance get on chain or why, why should they? Look... I think the why for them is going to be broadly in the faster, cheaper, better okay. yeah. um, bucket. Um, I think blockchain feels as though it's a technology which is really well suited to financial services. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you, can, can, you can execute your transactions on a platform that gives you the ability, like, transparency right like you can see what your transactions that are they're immutable they're mm. there um you can do it quickly um i mean the obvious examples are things like bonds and equities mm. and fx payments um i mean we used to talk about how if you want to send money to new zealand on a friday afternoon you might get it on a Monday afternoon or a Tuesday if you're lucky, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, whereas with stable coins, it could be there in five minutes. Um, and I think this, the same thing holds for big institutions. I mean, Australia's got a lot of fund managers. It's got a massive super sector. They're all looking to do we payments. They're all third, fourth biggest in the world in terms of pension and super. Yeah, I think I looked the other day and it was up to, up to $4 trillion. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. Um, yep. And that's all looking for a home. Um, and so, look, I hadn't intended to get onto asset tokenization here, and we can talk about that later. But again, sure, yeah. that's a massive opportunity for asset tokenization, right? And improved Absolutely. liquidity and blah, blah, blah. And so, look, I think, I think for banks, um, faster, cheaper, better is going to be a thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think 
another thing which I don't hear that many people talk about, especially in the banking, on the inside of the banks. Right. But as, as now having stepped outside and looking back in, I think blockchain would give them an advantage from a compliance point of view. Oh, absolutely. Like they, 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 yeah. they, they worry about blockchain yeah. because of frauds and scams and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that actually. We're all really, but actually, if you kind of spin it around a bit, blockchain could, it, like it's binary, right? Yeah. And yeah. so if you have a range of criteria that you need to address to trade with yep. this person or that institution, you can verify those yeah. straight away. You've got um, rules and regulation on the outside world or just in the world and you have enforcement after the fact, which means because you can still break the rules. I could sell a wholesale product to a yep. retail investor and get in trouble and we've seen businesses have that. But if it's written into the smart contract and if you're not whitelisted, then yeah. it's not going to happen. And I, I don't know about you, but I don't think I hear that narrative not as enough. much as I should. Not enough. Yeah, like, not can enough. you imagine if, um, you know, in diving into that, imagine if we were running things in terms of compliance and regulation, not just for finance, but just for a lot of other things. Like, oh, sorry, it's not in the contract and the rules just stop you there. You know, like imagine that running um, legislation that way. Yep. It's a far better kind of system. I agree. Yeah. Massively. But you're right that we don't speak about it enough. Yeah. And maybe another angle, just to throw mm -hmm. another one in the mix, is... Um, like real estate, mm -hmm. um, I mean, coming maybe coming away from sort of corporate and institution. Mm. If you want to look to look in the the sort of the the, the personal bank side, uh, people have mortgages. Those mortgages could be they could be stable coins, right? And then when yeah. you want to buy your house, yeah. the deeds of your house could be an NFT. Yeah, imagine in the future, hundred years from now, when we're still using this tech, the EMP hasn't blown up you know the sun itself has blown up we're still around but we've got these things where the nft has this history yep. and you trust it because it's been issued by you know um trusted bodies and whatnot yep. there's even folks uh, overseas i haven't seen it here yet but definitely overseas there's a few places like in qatar and in other places qatar i think it was a project they were looking at and in um african nations they were looking at this but university degrees um, when you go to uni, you're an NFT, right? That is only you, non-transferable NFT, yeah. uh, kind of like a soulbound token. Yep. The things that get attached to that, these tokens of your achievement of, you know, parts of the, the course and stuff and being able to take that and show that the, how LinkedIn and resumes and CVs look, the whole world looks really different when you've got something like that. So and again, it's I think that something that kind of leads on from that mm. and it will be at some point in the not too distant future, a thing for blockchain is going to be identity management. Yeah. yeah. Um, yep. And how do you how do you kind of have sort of sovereign control of your identity rather than rather than sending in your passport and your driver's license to some organisation for mm. them to then lose it through a data breach? How do you self-sovereign your identity yeah. and allow them access or give them some kind of zero knowledge proof of who you are so that you can and again, that would speed things up hugely as well, right? You know, the, on the ZK proof, we, have, we could, that could be a whole other episode, just as like RWA is, and so maybe we should yeah. do that. But it's interesting that you have these things happen where, you know, you have the things to look out for if there is a scam. Like, you know, I, I get an email from blackrock at gmail.com. Obviously, I know that that's not, <laughs> someone else might think it's real, but, you know, that's a telltale sign. But... Maybe, maybe Larry wants to come on the podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's LarryFink at gmail.com. <laughs> but I saw something where the DNS, the domain name uh, service writer, I forget what it's actually called, but it's um, the one that provides your domain name. That got hacked. And I think it was a Web3 related business that got hacked. So they were sending, the hackers were sending emails to people from the legit organization. They weren't legit because it was hacked, right? So it looked like it was okay and they got people to uh, believe in it and they scanned the QR code, did all that kind of stuff. Now imagine a situation where when you set up with a company like let's say with Cobweb Pay the Exchange, that there is a ZK proof that at the point of inception of your wallet there, the ZK proof is only from you know, Cobweb Pay Cloud Tech. And if there's new things that you guys need to get people to transact on, it's only believable if there's this, the 2FA here would be the, the ZK proof. Only you guys can actually do it. Now, someone would have to hack that to be able to get, but I think 
there, there are these things that blockchain helps us build with regulation, with innovation, with scam protection, with all this kind of stuff. It's fascinating. Oh, it, it, absolutely it is. And there are people who get it more than others. Mm. And there are people who still just see the space as the wild west and the scams and all the scams that. and yeah. all this and that. And I, I, I'm sure that'll persist for a while, but I yeah. think day by day, week by week, month by month, there'll be a migration from mm. people on planet TradFi to planet DeFi and, and that'll be a it'll be an interest the the space in the middle will be an interesting space. I think it will be and you know we're we're a small minority that's coming up with these solutions for the future. It's even a better world when there is that um, more uptake and others are, are bringing their ideas and I guess validating it. But where do you, Crystal Ball time, what do you see as like the future uh, of this space? Or where, where do you want to see it? Um, well, I think obviously we all want to see adoption growing, mm -hmm. but I think you, let's, let's assume we can take that as given. I think mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a range of things. I think we can focus on, on the corporate side, sure and say there's a whole bunch of opportunities there. So we talked about quicker payments, mm -hmm. better FX, mm -hmm. tokenized assets. Um, I think all that will sort of have a trickle down through things like the super funds yep. to individuals. Um, but I think maybe coming to the, the side of the, the individual pun to like retail people and not just people in Australia, um, blockchain's got the ability to to genuinely help people, and I think you mentioned it a little while ago, it's, there's a whole bunch of people who don't have bank accounts in the world. Yep. <clears throat> um, and with blockchain, they don't need to have a banking relationship. They just need to have an internet connection. Um, and so I think there's a huge amount of potential there. Mm. Um, there's also things in the press that you read, sort of heartening pieces that you read in the press from time to time about there be women who are in like violent relationships yeah. who don't have the financial means to to get out of those relationships, but they're a bit savvy and they they have a crypto wallet and they save in their crypto wallet yeah. until they have enough USDT or whatever it is to to get out of that relationship. Mm. So I think there's going to be the change will be positive, and I think it'll be across the whole spectrum of society. Um, somebody said to me the other day. Oh, but yeah, we're always going to need on and off ramps, aren't we? And I said, well, in the short term, yes, but in the medium term, maybe not, right? Yeah. And I think that's another thing. Would, will there be a tipping point whereby we don't, or we have less and less of a need for, for on and off ramps? I can see it happening. Are, are on and off ramps going to be like petrol stations, right? Well, yeah. The more and more yeah. people have electric cars, the less and less people are going to need petrol. Um, it's yeah, it's pretty true. I mean, like with Australia, you look at um, our uptake and we've got really great, uh, really great payment network and we're one of the first in the world, if not the first, to have the, the tap kind of system. Mm -hmm. Other countries, it took a while for us to get to, for them to get to that. But it's proven that when there is something innovative, it is better. It is um, maybe cheaper or, or whatever it is and just um, it's better than what was there before, that people will flock to that. We just need to show it's better. Yeah, like people and, need to be made aware of it. And just on the point of cheaper, I mean, you you don't have to go very far at the moment in Australia to read an article or see a news review about the cost of living. Yeah. And yeah, so, yeah, yeah. does think about it? Does does DeFi have the ability to to reduce the cost of living for the everyday Australian? Mm. I think it does because current state there's a whole bunch of companies sat in the middle mm. who are taking fees for this or yep. fees for that. And if they if they are kind of, if we go around those and those people are disintermediated, then the price could be cheaper, really. Yeah. Um, that so was, there's that angle as well. That's one of the big things that um, people forget uh, about this space. It's the automation. It's the ability to disintermediate um, necessary at the moment, like middlemen. Yep. Um, and what those middlemen, like, can I say that, like the corporations, not actually just people, they've got to figure out something else to add value in this new kind of market. Yep. Like if it's a given that things can be automated, if it's a given that everyone has access to tools like AI and wallets and all of these things, whatever you're providing into that world has to make things better. And this is how the wheel of innovation just continues. So yeah. it's a fascinating take. I, I like you know the opinions. I hope we can together like build um, this better kind of future together. Yeah, and look, I think there's a real sense of community. And yeah. I've said this to you before, but mm -hmm. um, 
coming from a tradfile environment to a yeah. DeFi environment, yeah. the, the sense of community yeah. is really striking. And I know you yeah. do a whole lot of great work Thank you. Um, yeah. with meetups and events and that kind of thing, and, and others do similar things. But uh, there's a great sense of community and collaboration, which isn't always there in the tradfi space. It's, yeah, it's interesting. I, it does make me wonder like how many years before we get like so norm that we just lose that kind of thing. Yeah. But hopefully what we do drive instead is that, okay, when everything is normal that way, that the meetups are more about that, okay, what's the new things? Now this is all normal in 10 years time, whatever, what's the new things? And the meetups continue because I think there is a lot of power from those connections. And just mm -hmm. um, going back to it with, with regards to uh, people wanting to get in touch with you because they want to chat more about this, they've got ideas for Ubiquity or they've got, you know, they just want to learn more about what, what you're doing. Um, where can they best reach out? Um, I think probably LinkedIn is a good place to start. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, CloudTech's on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. Ubiquity's on LinkedIn. Um, give all those people a follow. Um, we'll put, we put stuff out there pretty regularly. We'll be putting our major announcements out there. When AUDU goes live, Perfect. we'll be putting that out there. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's probably a good starting point. Okay, fantastic. Well, check out the show notes. And for now, Andrew, thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Mark.